So um, next we get to hear from two esteemed speakers, Dr. Clark Chang and Dr. William Tulo. And they're going to speak with us about the most updated keratoconus management guide. So I'd like to first introduce Dr. Clark Chang. He is the director of specialty lenses in the cornea department at Will's Eye Hospital. He is the host of the popular podcast show, The Chang Reaction, which I love that name. That's amazing. <laughs> And he has recently been nominated as the top doctor of 2020 by the National Keratoconus Foundation. With over a decade of research experiences in cornea cross-linking and other advanced corneal treatments, Dr. Chang publishes and lectures extensively in keratoconus management, modern contact lens technologies, and innovative refractive and corneal surgeries. And then Dr. Bill Tulo is a medical director of Oculus. <laughs> Previously, Bill was the VP of Clinical Services for TLC Laser Eye Centers for more than 20 years. Bill has maintained a private practice in his hometown of Princeton, New Jersey since 1988 and received his Doctor of Optometry degree from the State University of New York College of Optometry. He was the Assistant Clinical Professor at SUNY from 1988 to 1997. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a member of the American Optometric Association, and he was recognized by the American Academy of Optometry as a diplomate in cornea in the cornea and contact lens and refractive technology, which is the Academy's highest honor and very tough to get. So congratulations on that. So we are so excited to hear from you guys, and I'll go ahead and let you take it away from here. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Serenzi, for the intro. Uh, Dr. Tulo, I'm going to get you to unmute your mic. And here, here I am. And if I could, let's give this one, let's try this for uh, 30 seconds and see if I could share the control with you. And um, let's give that a try. I'm going to choose you. And just want to make sure that you receive the signal on your end. And let me know if everything's good to go on your end, Dr. Tulo. It's, let's see if it's working. You should have a yellow bar on top of your screen that says you are, you have control. And then if you uh, hover over the view and drop down, there should be, choose your keyboard layout and then you'll be all finished. And if that doesn't work, I can, no problem. We could figure out, um, I can advance the slides. Okay, it is not working, so you're going to be my slide advancer. For not today. a problem. So without further ado, let's continue just because I know we're the last two hours of the day and uh, we've been tasked to, um, and thanks to everybody for staying with us, we've been tasked with the uh, responsibility of basically summarizing um, all the good content that has occurred in the past two days. And obviously that's a tall task um, for <laughs> in one hour, but we're gonna give it a try in summarizing all the you know, detection and monitoring technologies, as well as treatment technologies, both present and in the future. And some of, the, um, some of the, these technologies you have heard from other speakers, but we're gonna try to see if we can find a fresh perspective um, to dissecting the information for everybody. So stay tuned. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about the fact that uh, we currently are, uh, you know, unaware of the exact prevalence rate for keratoconus patients, at least not within U.S. And I, the, why, the reason I make that point will become more evident in a few slides. And so obviously, classically, we quote patients with the, you know, one in 2000 prevalence rate. And um, that comes from uh, a study published in 1986 or 87, um, where they basically primarily utilize a rhinoscopy and keratometry to, um, to make such diagnosis in uh, Minnesota. And so around the world globally, there has been other epidemiology studies more recently that have shown different rates of um, prevalence in different population. Um, and so the conclusion is obviously we should, this should be on the forefront of our mind 
uh, if indeed that uh, may be instrumentation sensitivity, which is why it's so important uh, for us to understand the instruments that we have that's available to our clinical disposal in managing these patients and hopefully catching these patients while they're still asymptomatic, so unable to complain to you when they come for the exam, but being able to give them give them better outcome across their lifespan. And so again, if you I've listed the some of the more recent ones that have shown uh, different rate of prevalence outside of US, um, and they really vary. And, and there actually also have been uh, prevalence rates that's shown to be much lower than one in 2000, for example, in Russia. Um, so, you know, taking those things into consideration, I think we just need to go forward and collect more information, especially when, it, you know, all our colleagues that we can all network together and all have technologies that we're able, hopefully standardized and able to, you know, pull our data together, um, especially within US, then I think we'll be have a better idea in terms of what our prevalence rate within US population uh, across the country would be like. So um, what else is new? We've uh, talked about the fact that, or at least other speakers have talked about the fact that uh, there's a redefining moment in 2015 with this publication that came out um, to give us a little more guidance, knowing that many different clinical practices, including instrumentation and definition criteria, um, both for detecting keratoconus and monitoring for progression have not really been standardized. So let's start with, you know, separating or redefining the disease, what is primary and what is secondary hepatic diseases. So you see here that uh, the first four list entities listed on the top uh, of, the, of the slide, keratoconus, your uh, post-refractive surgery ectasia, your pellucid, your keratoglo uh, keratoglobus, those are defined as uh, the primary ectatic diseases. And obviously, um, keratoconus is one of the most common form of irregular cornea, which brings about the fact that it is uh, of critical importance in the future to know that how to you know, timely uh, detect the patient as early as possible, as well as providing treatment and intervention options as soon as possible. So therefore, knowing the prevalence specific to a region and specific to an ethnicity group even uh, can be very important going forward. So the, uh, that same publication from 2015 in Cornea uh, also gave us some, you know, shed light in some of the clinical confusions or debates that we've had before in the past. And that is, is it possible to have, given the genetic component and the environmental component that, and other components that uh, presumably you know, exerts equal stress to, uh, you know, on either side of the, the, across the midline of the body, is there really such a thing as true as unilateral keratoconus? And so their opinion is that, um, and, and, you know, we'll come back to this point, but, you know, their opinion is that that does not apply to keratoconus patients by definition, um, that if one eye uh, manifests such a uh, symptom and has the diagnosis, you know, the other eye likely uh, is also keratoconus conic and should be regarded as such in our management options. Um, we used to think that obviously the classic definition of thinning uh, is a um, hallmark of keratoconus. And so there's some thoughts about maybe then could we just rely on pachymetry? And while that is a really good thought and we'll you know, look at the advancement in, look, in being able to map out global pachymetry a little bit later, but relying only on a central pachymetry such as with your ultrasound probe uh, is unlikely to be reliable. And that the thinning and the location of the pattern um, really is what distinguishes between your keratoconus, keratoglobus, uh, mm -hmm. as well as pellucid. And uh, that, that's the reason why it's best differentiated by a combination of the four factors or four instruments that I uh, have listed for you, including your tomography, a global thickness distribution, slit lamp, very useful to actually, especially I think in looking at keratoconus and pellucid, um, there's some confusions or overlap in there, how they manifest topographically could look very similar um, in certain stages of keratoconus versus uh, pellucid. And so looking at the exact area of thinning uh, in your slit lamp, uh, where the thinning is not at the uh, apex and it's a little much closer to the limbus for pellucid, um, so that can help to 
add into the uh, your differentiation or power of detection in defining or diagnosing keratoconus and curvature of your anterior curvature maps as well as your elevation maps. And so uh, what is then exactly do we think is uh, mandatory or required to diagnose keratoconus? Well, according to um, this group of experts that uh, went through a Delphi panel type of discussion, came up with their uh, clinical recommendation, and these are experts 36 experts across the world from four supranational corneal society, uh, corneal society um, that said, well, you know, given today's technology, very important to understand that this likely will evolve when technology evolves and our understanding and definition of the pathogenesis, the pathogenesis of keratoconus evolves as well in the future. But with the current technology, that they require an abnormal posterior elevation, which you heard from Dr. Aiden and Dr. Barnett earlier today about um, the importance of looking at posterior aspect uh, of the ectasia and looking at the thickness distribution going from the thinnest point outward and plotting out that relationship such as uh, what we have on the picture to the top right, uh, where you can see the graphs mapping out your CTP and PTSI. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a couple slides later. And as well as the clinically, the corneal thinning should be clinically non-inflammatory. Um, so while you could have um, inflammatory markers in your tear film and, and you know, other layers in your um, existing or have been reported in keratoconus patient, there shouldn't be clinically observable inflammation like, you know, hyperemia, whether it's secondary to maybe other infections or dryness uh, or other ocular surface issues. Um, so clinically it should be non-inflammatory. The, you know, the eye should technically be white and quiet. And therefore, the you know, given today's technology, then if you want to have all these, um, you want to have elevation maps specifically posteriorly and looking at global distribution of the corneal thickness, then the publication concluded that the best current technology and the most uh, widely available diagnostic test would then be a tomography that is shine fluke uh, or OCT based. So that just say that yes, we've arrived at we can all we all have a standardized uh, or share similar definition in how to def, uh, how to detect keratoconus. How would you then continue to if progression is to be used as a guide for us to recommend different treatment options? Then how do you determine clinical progression is happening or not? Um, so again, the same publication then say well then we let's at least make sure that we hit two of the three following parameters be to be able to say whether or not the cornea is or the ectasia is progressing. So that means progressive steepening of the anterior surface, which topography tomography can both do, and progressive steepening of the posterior cornea surface. Remember the posterior elevation abnormality was one of the required criteria by the this group of experts to detect keratoconus. So that it serves the um, it's, it makes sense that posterior steepening curvature changes would also be one of the criteria then that we are able to use to diet to uh, monitor progression of keratoconus patients. Um, and that topography cannot do, but tomography can do. Um, and as well as mapping out what I call optical, uh, optical pachymetry or your global uh, pachymetry so that going from the thinnest point of the cornea to out to the periphery and mapping out the relationship of, um, of thickening towards the periphery. We all know that the corneal asphericity uh, is such that we flatten out towards the periphery. And because of that, your cornea and a different rate of asphericity, both anteriorly and posteriorly, um, it, that uh, it makes sense clinically that your cornea is going to thicken towards the periphery, right? And But if it thickens way too much more than you expect, then somewhere within central or paracentral area, um, there must be some sort of significant thinning. Um, and that's the reason why looking at global distribution of pachymetry more than one single data is very important. So not relying on your central pachymetry or even just apical pachymetry. Um, and that I think one of the takeaway that's very important to me from this publication is something that I think we've known to be true for a long time. And that is, although progression can be 
accompanied by a decrease in your best corrected um, spectacle vision uh, or best corrected uh, vision, that uh, a change in your uncorrected or your best corrected vision is actually not required to document progression because it depends on exactly where the irregularity, how it co coincides or overlap with the area or the zone of your visual axis, right? Um, so therefore, don't rely on, we need to work hard at separating our treatment and, and our detection of keratoconus um, in terms of the, at least of two different dimensions of keratoconus patients. And that is the visual component, which we can do very well with uh, all, the, all the modern advancement of contact lenses that Dr. Christine Sin and I are gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, and other surgical means that you've heard uh, Dr. Greenstein talked about and Dr. Tulo is gonna touch up on a little bit later. So that's the visual aspect. And we tend to focus a lot on that because that is where the primary you know, gatekeeper to vision, I understand that. But the progressive component is the part that we typically have not really paid that much attention to. And that really is the reason why we have to work hard at, you know, on standardizing our criteria for detecting keratoconus as well as monitoring for progression. So don't always think that you need to have visual impairment or redu reducing vision in order for progression to be occurring. So given that then, and you've heard a lot of different technology being mentioned already, what exactly um, do we, you know, what if, um, and I think the, um, the poll yesterday, the survey from the attendees have shown that they actually, this is a group of elite care, uh, primary vision caretakers uh, or eye care provider because 50, at least 50% 50 of you have responded to say you have topography or access to topography in your clinic. Um, but that remains that we still have um, locations that you may not have access to such technology or maybe your work or, or, or maybe not uh, at all in your clinic. And so what else can you utilize prior to getting to some of these detection technologies that we want to talk about? And that is, there's a trend of uh, cup, uh, pairing different risk factors of keratoconus in order to bring up the sensitivity value and the, specific, uh, and the specificity value of both diagnosing keratoconus and determine progression. So even without instrumentation, if that's what we're working with in a location where you don't have the instruments of topography or tomography, then you could choose different risk factors where we closely monitor or interview patients about, and that is their family history of keratoconus, being that there is a genetic component. Uh, we know that the first degree relative of keratoconus patient uh, has um, has or have a very high likelihood or at least much higher risk uh, likelihood of developing keratoconus by 15 to 67 folds. And so if somebody tells you that their parents have keratoconus, for example, because first degree relative, um, then you do want to pay attention in monitoring the patients very closely, even if the patient is not, uh, is not complaining of any symptoms or maybe actively um, discuss family member screening of their offsprings. Um, so those are kind of, uh, that's what I meant by looking at family history. Uh, chronic eye rubbing, although eye rubbing by itself does not guarantee or mean absolutely um, that keratoconus will develop, if it couples with different risk factors that we're gonna talk about, including family history, <clears throat> excuse me, that then can become uh, more important in your clinical judgment tool. And obviously listen for the visual, their subjective symptoms. Although, you know, impairment of vision does not have to occur at the time of diagnosis or the time of uh, detecting progression, having reduced visual acuity that's unexplained can be a, uh, can be a, a big red flag, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's whether glare, halo, ghosting, start bursting, or just frequent changes in their prescription or never could reach um, the quality of vision that they like, <clears throat> Excuse me. regardless of content lens refitting or uh, glasses uh, prescription changes. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at their qualitative keratometry um, tests, such as maybe auto, if you have a placido uh, ring projection uh, technology, whether it's your manual uh, keratometry, we still have that around. We I, I have that in the at Wells Eye, but it's something that I don't see a lot anymore in new um, eye clinics. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So, um, but, you know, auto refractor can have that too. So sometimes, you know, it's worth if you feel like your exam results in the refractive component is not making sense, you possibly could walk back to the, you know, and have the patient sit in front of the auto refractor again, if the auto keratometer screen shows you placido disc Myers and look to see if there's any area specifically in the inferior um, portion of the cornea that has any distortion uh, or to the to the Meyer quality, so qualitative assessment, and then increasing astigmatism um, and changing in their prescription, as we talked about, because as per the uh, you know Academy of Ophthalmology preferred practice pattern, it deserves you know any type of suspicion or for keratoconus progression or, you know, confirmation of progressive uh, keratoconus then determine further workup uh, and treatment intervention. And so why did I, you know, spend some time discussing uh, the importance of asking about eye rubbing? Um, because it, there's almost no doubt if you look at this MRI image of a healthy, this is a healthy subject with no keratoconus. So you could see how much the force is distributed across the entire eye walls, right? It's not just to the cornea and look at how it kind of ricochets back and forth. So just the, I'm just, the, that's not even talk about the fact that keratoconus patient may have a specific type of rubbing pattern and exerts much harder force when they rub their eyes. Uh, it could also be occurring during their sleep when they're put placing their, you know, uh, their eyes specifically more one-sided uh, against the, their elbow or their knuckles. Um, so potentially something to be able to discuss with patients and do all that we can to control any stimulus that uh, or stimuli that leads to eye rubbing. And so as we kind of move up the technology spectrum, uh, if we, again, like I said, if we didn't have topography, um, we can rely on all the things that I have talked about, including, you know, looking at keratometer. Um, and it used to be that for refractive surgery screening, we're thinking, oh, you know, 49, uh, or steeper, 40A and a half or steeper, that's sort of suspicious. Um, and understanding that because now we actually have treatment option at earlier stage, being able to hopefully preserve patient's vision by stabilizing, um, stabilizing our patients, that we a drop in that there's been a clinical trend in dropping that clinical threshold to say, you know, greater than in your SIMK or any type of keratometry that you can perform, if the steepest keratometry is greater than 47 diopter, and especially again, pairing, right? The risk factor scale, especially if they have family history uh, that we talked about eye rubbing and they have frequent changes in their prescription. Um, those are all kinds of things that then uh, we want to pay attention to and watch the patient very closely because you're not going to really, it's, obviously very easy to diagnose advanced keratoconus, right? And sort of like glaucoma, very similar to our glaucoma management, your structural or anatomical damage isn't going to be your first sign. So you're not going to look for, you know, corneal scarring or your Fleischer ring or your, you know, voice A as your first sign keratoconus detection, because if that's what we rely on, then we're typically missing the opportunity uh, to diagnose patients at an early stage. So if you have access to topography, then very similar to say your Humphrey, um, you know, visual feel, right? You're looking for asymmetry, whether it's by your, uh, you know, whether by your GHC, uh, GHT index test to compare your superior and inferior and see if there's any difference, um, that kind of thing. So if you have topography, we're really looking at asymmetry in the pattern of the uh, curvature analysis on the cornea and also compare interocularly. So again, looking at that uh, keratometry value, asymmetism, there's been studies showing that myokeratoconus patients, uh, and as far back as 1995, that is, you know, topographic astigmatism greater than one and a half diopter is, can be uh, the average value in myokeratoconus patient. Recently, there's a, I think, paper by David Pinero um, that show when the when he surveyed, um, I think up to 200 patients and break patient down into three different stages, your mild, moderate, severe, and 1.81 diopter, 
was roughly was the mean average cylinder or astigmatism manifested by mild keratoconus patients. So by no means or do we have to wait for five diopter astigmatism before you think, oh, that's something going on there. Um, you know, somebody maybe higher than two diopter um, is, and especially again, paired together with the, you know, increase in refractive shift and other risk factor that we talked about should then be monitored very closely. But coming back to topography, looking for that asymmetry, looking for the, um, your bow ties to be asymmetrically weighted, as well as the skewing of the bow tie, like um, the top two topography maps that I'm sure that is being shown on your left hand side. And then that's where, you know, determining inferior superior ratio can be potentially helpful, because that then shows you the, the uh, asymmetry across your hemisphere of, on the cornea. And in, most importantly, I think we're following patients with very small amount and consistent increases. And why did I say small? Because again, we used to be much more forgiving in detecting patients and letting progression occurring for a while because we only had the treatment option of corneal transplant and, and typically full thickness and contact lens. So at that point, it probably doesn't matter what the interval of, um, you know, of magnitude is in defining, oh, there's a significant enough of a progression for us to do something. We now have treatment options to be able to stabilize patients at an earlier age, at an earlier stage, and preserve their vision. And that's why we need to tighten up our threshold value to, to have a much lower threshold value uh, in uh, allowing progression to continue to occur. So, you know, um, there we talked about their risk factors that uh, can only be determined with tomography when you can look at both front and both anterior and posterior aspect of the cornea in evaluating elevation, not just curvature, but also giving us the um, the global thickness, uh, the pachymetry distribution pattern. So looking at those values and understanding that in a normative database uh, done by Oculus, it does show that posterior elevation may be different uh, depending on refractive error of the eye. And this is in normal cornea patients. And so therefore that's why the 18 micron and 28 micron cutoff value that I have had, that I have highlighted for you. Another thing then to also look at, remember I mentioned not just asymmetry within one eye, but also interocularly. So also looking at pachymetry map, if you're not looking at global distribution from the thinnest point outward, even if you look at the apical or the thinnest location and the difference between eyes, only less than 1% of the population has a difference between left and right eye in normal cornea to have greater a difference greater than 25, uh, equal or greater than 25 micron. So if somebody has 30 micron difference in the thinnest point between left and right, should look at the elevation map and you know other um, software analytical tools very closely to see, is it a possibility that this person um, this patient in front of you has keratoconus. So then we come to a very important, um, you know, e question, and that is, what exactly are we looking at, whether it's elevation map or um, curvature map? What does, we all know that in, a, in the, <clears throat> the scale that we're more accustomed to in North America, your, you know, warm color series is the steeper or the more elevated, your cool color series uh, is the sort of more sunken and uh, flatter curvature analysis, depending on which map you're looking at. But how is that determined? Uh, and also understanding that color scale may be different pending instrument or as well as pending region you're in. But um, most of the time, there's a best fit sphere that is, um, uh, a good mathematical averaging of the curvature or the elevation of the a specific area we're looking at, uh, maybe central eight or nine millimeter of the cornea. And then um, the raw data that is being then overlay on top of that best fit sphere, anything that is above is elevated or steeper. Anything that's below, like the two sides of the isosceles 
uh, triangle is uh, that below the yellow line is then regarded as being more sunken or lower in elevation or flatter in curvature. So here's the interesting question then. Obviously very easy if you have a bit more advanced keratoconus uh, as shown by the peak of this triangle, there's a lot of distance between that and your yellow best fit sphere. So it's easy to see, oh, there's a central island here in the elevation map showing that there's some protrusion that is not normal. And then we utilize that to then decide, okay, is this keratoconus or not? But if somebody is a very early, um, maybe preclinical or early keratoconus, where that distance between the triangle, the peak of the triangle being very close to the yellow um, baseline, your best fit sphere, that value is so low, it may then sometimes slip through uh, our attention. So what can we do to enhance our uh, rate of being able to capture these patients? Well, the idea of an enhanced map uh, software, which we utilize, remember your best fit sphere is somewhat of a mathematical averaging of uh, that's a central eight millimeter of your curvature value, right? Or elevation magnitude, depending which map you look at. Um, that's the elevation in this case. Which area do we think is going to really mess up the averaging of the best fit sphere? Meaning with the apex of the cornea, you're gonna artificially steepen the, um, your best fit sphere value and therefore narrow down on the distance between the apex and the, uh, the differential between the, the peak of the triangle and the yellow line. So what if we just hide that? What if we remove data using computer AI, remove data of in the central, around central three millimeter, uh, circling the, the uh, thinnest point? Because the thinnest point corresponds quite well uh, to the apex of your keratoconus. So that way you're dropping, you're flattening out, if you would, uh, or lowering that uh, best sphere a uh, best fit sphere and therefore artificially lengthening the distance between the peak of the triangle and the, um, and the base of the yellow line and therefore making it much easier for you to detect even a small uh, cone-like protrusion. And that's what this map is showing. If you look at the, the BAD display here uh, that I'm circling right now, it says elevation back. Um, this is the BAD map for the posterior elevation. If you look at the difference map, Oh, the, it, it shows you that there is, even though it's a small amount, there is a likelihood that, um, that there's a abnormal amount of elevation presenting itself in this eye, even though in the first four map on the top, uh, this, the top map is similar to what you're seeing in the first four map that you have seen from Dr. Iden's uh, lecture, even though that doesn't show a whole lot of red uh, in the center where the apex is, in the difference map is what tells the story. So this is known as the, um, the BAD or the um, for enhanced detection. And possibly you could then say, well, then could I just use that um, enhanced map to show if something's getting worse to track progression? Or can I use the, you know, the, uh, the, the PTI, the global distribution uh, as the curve of the, because you have heard this from Dr. Iden, so I'm not going to really go through why these distribution uh, graphs are very important. Um, but one of the most important clinical uh, metric is this final D value that's showing 4.0, uh, which means four standard deviation away from the, the mean of uh, a normal population. And so the likelihood then, if you're being that many standard deviation away from norm, is that this cornea is really abnormal, right? So could you then also use that value to say, well, then can, if that value gets worse, then that's a science progression. Maybe, but it probably then again, if the idea is to catch the earliest amount of progression and not letting it keep occurring, that probably isn't going to get us to the goal of getting the earliest um, prediction for progression. So what can we do here? Let's go back to this map where we said, okay, if we hide the um, the apical area to lower that best fit sphere, maybe we can enhance the distance between the peak of the triangle and the base of the reference line. So what if we do the reverse? We, I think we'll all agree that if keratoconus is progressing, it's not likely to occur in the more near normal peripheral area first. 
it's probably going to occur more closer to the apical area of the keratoconus first, right? So therefore, what if we just focus on that central three millimeter area surrounding the thinnest area um, to look at that data only? So if we do that, that's where they came up with the, uh, Dr. Bellin came up with this ABCD um, new scale a stands for anterior curvature and can be able to track over time. B stands for posterior. C is the thinnest pachymetry. D is best corrected spectacle visual acuity. And that kind of surpasses a lot of the, um, the emsler um downfall or limitation of the prior classification system, again, that you had heard uh, earlier today from Dr. Barnett and Dr. Iden. So this is your ABCD and tracking over time in serial comparison, different color bar shows you different states that you are able and they're juxtaposed, you could compare the longer the bar, basically the more um, severe the staging. So something's progressing if it gets longer. And what I think to me is most important, I'm going to kind of fast is this. I think the fact that they actually include a statistical normative database to show me the confidence interval of something is changing both in the normal cornea population, that is your green, uh, green flags or green gates, uh, both 80% confidence level and 95%. And in your keratoconus cornea, those are your red flags or your red gates, um, both in the, the dashed line 80% confidence interval and 95%. To me, that's very, that is very useful because I then that gives me a sense of whether or not I think that if someone is progressing, is that hopefully above that, um, that instrument noise that we talked about, right? How confident am I? that a change is occurring is actually significant statistically. When it reaches that 95%, then I am much more assured that, okay, especially if it's repeatable, that means that the progression is likely occurring. So I find this to be very helpful and be able to help me capture the earliest point um, of uh, progression. And we talked about the fact that obviously a shine fluke image uh, technology is great, and especially with all the softwares that I have mentioned, the capacity of the software. But sometimes, you know, a corneal capacity like a scar can change its detection, and OCT can be a little bit better than that. Um, but, you know, right now, though, I would say OCT at least in my own practice as well as I, I'm more using it as, you know, an adjunct um, sort of tiebreaker if I really couldn't figure out. Uh, there are many different small risk factors that's all kind of compiling together, but I'm still not exactly sure if patient is keratoconus. Sometimes looking at that donut area that, again, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Iden had talked about can be helpful. You can see how the, oh, if I overlay it on the topography map, the Excel map, the area of the thinning from this OCT map is exactly where, or very coincides very closely to the area of steepening because the epithelium remodeling is gonna thin out the epithelium on top of the apex. So that can sometimes help me, I think, uh, be able to improve my, my degree of suspicion if this is a keratoconus patient. And I think you'll go into the, into the future utilizing these artificial intelligence system computational analysis, um, being able to determine biomechanics can be very important. Here you have an example of a patient who is what, coming back to the very first point that, you know, from the opening of the, the lecture, do you have unilateral keratoconus? patients, right? So if you look in the left eye with the K-Max, with the radius skew, with the asymmetry of the bull tie, it's pretty definitive that this is a keratoconus patient, especially if your slit lamp exam does not find anything to counter those findings. Whereas if you only look at the right eye, it looks relatively regular. So does that mean the right, this is a unilateral keratoconus patient and the right eye actually, you know, may be able to undergo refractive surgery? So if we put that patient, to, um, that patient the, in the right eye, combining topography with um, biomechanical test, which is not available yet in US, you could see that the risk level of this uh, topographically normal, quote unquote, normal looking eye actually has a very high risk of being abnormal. And so again, likely point to the fact that there's not really un cases for unilateral keratoconus patient and that biomechanical changes in the future may be what we have to rely on. Um, 
So I'm gonna pass the baton back to Dr. Tulo to talk about more treatment options, what happens once we detect keratoconus patients, and especially if we start noticing progression. Dr. Tulo? Thanks, Clark. Um, I only have 11 minutes, so I'm gonna go very fast. I apologize for um, our time constraints. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the treatment aspects of keratoconus and erectatic diseases. Um, I wanna get across a really important concept that I think is very, very important, especially for optometry, since our crucial role in detecting this disease, the majority of these patients already reside in our offices. And I think we need to change our mentality. And we break this up into three different challenges. The first challenge is detecting now keratoconus before vision is lost. So detecting it as early as possible. And that's because with the second challenge, we now have a a treatment that can halt the progression of the disease before vision is lost. So it's really important this early detection can't be overemphasized. And the third challenge is in helping those patients vision rehabilitate after whatever treatments we decide, whether it's cross-linking or cross-linking combined with other off-label treatments. Okay, my folding stopped working. Um, can, Thank you, Clark. So again, the new mantra in the detection of, of keratoconus is that early diagnosis before vision is lost. In the past, we always would wait till that patient did not refract to 2020. And then at some point, maybe eventually order some advanced testing. But typically by that time, the patient has already lost best corrected vision. The challenge I try to teach every optometrist that I work with is finding this disease before it finds us. So looking for it whenever we suspect it and Clark did a great job about talking about the different ways of doing that. So let's talk a little bit about corneal cross-linking and its current existence in the United States and how it got FDA approved. I think if you understand the FDA approval process, you can understand how cross-linking works um, and where we're going in the future. Um, if you look at the FDA study that got approval, the inclusion, inclusion criteria included patients 14 years old up to 65 years old. So just because someone's older, if they are still progressing, they are still a great candidate for corneal cross-linking. Um, they had to have keratoconus or ectasia after refractive surgery with a confirmed diagnosis. Uh, and that was consistent with axial topography with case of 47 or greater, or an IS ratio, asymmetry of greater than 1.5 diopters, um, or best corrected vision loss um, in one eye, um, less than 2020 on an ETDRS chart. Um, and here's the part that even a lot of people out there doing cross-linking often forget is that the, the FDA study included patients with corneas as thin as 300 microns, and we'll talk about why that's very appropriate because of the way we do the cross-linking. And they defined progression in the FDA study that over a 24 month period that you had either an increase in corneal steep value of one diopter, increase of manifest astigmatism of one diopter, a myopic shift of a half diopter on subjective refraction or a, uh, a steepening of the base curve of their rigid gas permeable contact lens of 0.1 millimeter. So this is the criteria that was utilized in the study. Let's see if we can get this to go. Clark, can you fall? Thank you. When you look at the outcome of the study, the study had two arms in the study, um, the treatment arm and the placebo arm. And in the treatment arm, which was in blue here, you see that, that the majority of patients, their corneas flatten and continue to flatten over time um, as much as almost uh, two diopters or after a 12 month period. And the treatment arm with the placebo arm in the pink, you see those patients just continue to steepen and get worse over time. So it's very definitive that cross-linking works. And the cross-linking procedure and platform is, is um, made up of um, a, a device and, and two pharmaceutical agents. And the indication that they got approval for was progressive keratoconus. And that's why what Clark talked about is so important. We need to really assess the progression of keratoconus and making sure that we're not looking at noise. Um, the FDA approved procedure, as you all know, is, is removal of epithelium by any method that you feel comfortable. It could be a sponge, a spatula, or a brush, whatever you, whatever you normally would take epithelium off in PRK was also what you would do in cross-linking. And then you would soak the cornea with the Fotrexis viscous. Um, this is a solution you need to load the cornea in. You put a drop in every two minutes for 30 minutes, and then you check to see if you have 
not only a uniformly loaded cornea, but also flare in the anterior chamber. And if you don't, you need to continue to put the foot tracks to viscous until you do have a uniform loading and flare in the anterior chamber. Once that occurs, then you want to check corneal thickness. You want to make sure you do have a 400 micron cornea. If you don't, you can then take the hypotonic Fotrexa and add drops every two minutes and then recheck the corneal thickness until it's 400 microns. Once you have a 400 micron cornea, it's safe to do the final part, which is the irradiation with the UVA light for 30 minutes. While that irradiation goes on for 30 minutes, you still put a drop of Fotrexa viscous every two minutes throughout this process. Next slide, Clark. This is a study by Dan Fuller at the Southern College of Optometry to just show the effectiveness of the Fotrexa hypotonic in swelling corneas. And the study even showed that while the average was about 75 to 80 microns of swelling, you can actually in some corneas get as much as 161 microns of swelling. So you can take thin corneas and be pretty confident when they're on the table, you're going to be able to swell them to a safe value to proceed with the procedure. Um, one of the questions, especially I used to hear it when we first got approval for cross-linking, was, well, it's not covered by insurance and it's very expensive. Well, that has changed, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. If you look now across the 50 states, um, the majority of people are covered. 96% of commercial lives are covered. So this is now a very well-covered procedure by most uh, commercial insurance carriers. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing is very important is for patients to understand what cross-linking is and what it isn't. Um, so you need to take the time to explain to them, this does not cure keratoconus. And what it actually does is it indicates to halt or slow down the progression of the disease. And patients need to understand what that is. They're still going to need post-operative visual correction, likely with uh, specialty contact lenses or some other visual device. This is a study, an interesting study. Um, that was a simulation of 2,000 patients with 4,000 eyes. Um, it showed us a couple of things. Number one, they use a four to one ratio of slow to fast progressors, which is important to know because the fast progressors are the more insidious ones that you need to be really on top of and be and monitor them really carefully. But what it showed is the impact of cross-linking on this population. And we had a, an average of 20, 26% reduction in PK, the need for a corneal transplant. But if you break that down into slow and fast progressors, what you look at those fast progressors, that 90 2% of them would need a PK if they didn't get cross-linking. And if they did get cross-linking, only 2.5%. So a dramatic reduction in the need for a corneal transplant on those fast progressors. Even significant on the slow progressors, but boy, look at those fast progressors. It really saved them from a huge economic burden and visual quality of life burden. So on average, they calculated it was 28 fewer years in the advanced stages of disease by implementing cross-linking for these patients. Here are two studies that also talks about the quality of life. I think a lot of us don't recognize the impact of quality of life on, on our patients. On the Candale study, it showed us that uh, my patients may achieve 2020 vision with a contact lens. What we don't account for often is the quality and the number of hours they can wear a lens. I have patients who get referred to me that um, are, have 2020 vision, but can only wear a lens for eight to 10 hours a day. So their whole life is around those eight to 10 hours. So the pain, the discomfort, the reduction in wearing time is something we need to take into account on these patients and we need to strive to make it better. The Panthea study also showed us another important factor that the quality of life in keratoconic patients drops dramatically when their best eye, the eye with the best corrected vision starts to lose best corrected vision. So we need to focus not just on the worst eye and work really hard to rehabilitate that, but also maintain the vision in the best eye. Um, also, we know that cross-linking is very synergistic with our forms of optical rehabilitation. Unlike some other forms of keratoconic surgeries in the past, cross-linking does not make fitting contact lenses more difficult. In fact, in some cases, it can make the outcomes even more successful. Next slide, please. So here's the questions that I hear from my patients. It's very important to answer these well to patients. And one, the number one is, especially when you're dealing with children and parents, is why can't I just wait longer? Why can't I wait a few more years until they grow up and, and help have them be part of the decision-making process? Well, I think, you know, the, the um, COVID crisis 
helped us understand why waiting is not in the best interest of these keratoconic dyes. The first two studies here, the Shah and the Gauss study, show that waiting is as little as five or six months will have patients lose one line of vision or more. Um, the Chaxis study showed us that K-max increases more than a diopter within 12 months of delayed treatment. And finally, in the Romana study, it showed us it broke down our keratoconus into our young keratoconus, less than 18, and our older keratoconus. And they made specific recommendations. When you see progression less than 18, do not wait more than six weeks till you treat them. If they're more than 18, don't wait more than 12 weeks. So rapid treatment is really essential. So here's a great study. One of our earlier speakers, Dr. Greenstein, helped, helped us to know, well, how long does it last? And five years ago, we couldn't really answer this question. There was not a lot of good data, even outside of US, but this study was done in, in New Jersey uh, by Stephen Greenstein, and it showed us two th important things. Number one is that even 10 years after um, epithelial off the Dresden protocol uh, cross-linking, eye link, that we have stable topography and stable best corrected vision. And if you look at the stable best corrected vision, you break it down into the ectasia eyes after LASIK and the keratoconus eyes. And cross-linking in its current form is, is more effective in our keratoconus eyes. And you can see that 10 years later, 100% of the keratoconus eyes had stable best corrected vision. Quite remarkable for any procedure. Um, Post-op considerations, if you're co-managing this, you're going to see the patient like a PRK patient, they'll have a bandage contact lens on, they'll be taking topical antibiotics, steroid, non-steroidal, lubrication drops, and oral medication for pain. And the side effects you're going to see are the same kind of side effects you see in PRK. The majority of them occur in the first few weeks up to a month after the procedure, and then most of them are resolved very quickly within six months. And those things include like epithelial defects, pain, and discomfort, all the things that we're accustomed to seeing in PRK patients. Um, as far as contact lens fitting, I know Clark talks a lot about this in his lectures, um, and it does vary depending on the situation, if it's the first or the second eye you're cross-linking, and what kind of lenses they were wearing before the treatment. But on average, I resume contact lens wear or fitting about one month after the cross-linking procedure. But there are some exceptions if a patient's wearing a soft or a piggyback or even a scleral lens. There are times where I can resume lens wear even faster, but it is very patient-dependent. But usually by four weeks, we can do everybody. The, the post-op care is just like PRK. So you, after the bandage lens comes off in a week, you see them at one month, three months, six months, and 12 months, and monitor them with topography. Um, I think if you understand how cross-linking works, you can understand where we're heading with cross-linking and some of the new protocols. The three things that are important, again, are the riboflavin, the pharmacological agent, the ultraviolet light, which is the activator, and oxygen is, in, is a very important as a catalyst. Next slide, please. Um, I want to introduce you. Let's go back one slide, Clark. I just want to introduce the, the uh, study that's now um, enrollment is being completed. It's a phase three study by Glaucos with epithelial on. I think this will have a huge impact for optometry and ophthalmology. Again, making this, this procedure um, effective and safe to do in all ages. This was a study of 279 eyes broken up into control eyes, which were placebo and actively treated eyes, 180 eyes, and endpoints were achieved um, on this, uh, showing that this is as effective and as safe as epi off cross -linking. And the way this was established was by uh, a, a uh, proprietary epithelial on formulation that, that dissolved or weakened the, the demisone, hemidemisone bond between epithelial cells, use supplemental oxygen to increase the efficacy and higher energy pulsed UV light to get more efficacy out of this also. So did we get e efficacy similar to or greater than epi off traditional Dresden protocol? Next slide. Clark, let's go, um, yeah, why don't, why don't we go through CARS procedure? This is a procedure similar to the FDA approved intact procedure, but instead of using plastic segments, this is actually using human donor tissue. Um, and we use that as the implant segments. And you can see here the donor tissue is, is transplanted. We cut these into segments and we use the segments actually in the same femto channels that we would use at intacts. Um, again, to achieve the same biomechanical normalization and strengthening of the cornea that we would in intact procedures. Um, and again, just another option, not yet FDA approved. Um, this CARS procedure is really uh, an exciting new procedure. Clark, next slide, please. 
I just want to quickly show the difference that uh, people could see from uh, this is a case from Dr. Parker and Dockery that the height difference and the smoothing just after cars and they had almost nearly 20 diopter of flattening, uh, which is pretty amazing. Pretty amazing for a, a, a procedure which people thought, well, it's not as firm as a piece of plastic, maybe it won't work <laughs> as well. And I think that the, the initial evidence is that it works very nicely. I want to mention another off-label uh, procedure that I have a bit of experience with, which is topogotti PRK combined with cross-linking, initially done by John Canalopoulos, where he would actually do the, uh, the topo PRK first and then the cross-linking second. And um, on this slide here, you see it's actually a study by Dr. Donenfeld's group, and he did it the exact opposite. He would do cross-linking first and topogotti PRK second. And in his study, um, at 12 months, he saw uncorrected vision increase of three lines and corrected vision increase mean of two lines. So these procedures are being refined and getting better and better. And these are just all ways to help these patients not only stabilize, but improve the quality of their vision, even though many of them still have to wear vision correction, including specialty contact lenses. And again, Clark, we're running out of time. So why don't we go right to your last slide? Right. So um, just want to show everybody how I know Dr. Greenstein had talked about um, the, the rise in utilizing DOLC. Um, and hopefully using OCT guidance in the future will be, allow us to perform this more often than uh, when needed, more often than a full thickness trend penetrating keratoconus, uh, in keratoconus patient, uh, a PKP. Um, so here you can see we're tree finding um, down to as close to decime as we can. Obviously, if you have scarring that damages the decime like a hydrops, um, then it's, it's not possible um, to be able to uh, do this. And also keratoconus patients who have very thin cornea, sometimes the decime can actually blow out. Um, and so that's the reason why currently it's still sort of 50-50 where we may have to convert to a full thickness. But you saw that using the big bubble um, to separate, injected in the stroma to separate the as much stroma as we can from the decime. And also that we had injected air bubble into the air, uh, into the anterior chamber. And that shows us, you'll see why we do that. But here we're teasing out the tissue as, as much as we can down to the decime, as careful as we can. This is called brave slash because it's possible that will breach the endothelium. Um, so when you see that the air, the anterior chamber bubble is still intact after we uh, decide to, uh, after that brave slash, it shows us that we didn't breach the endothelium. And so can kind of take a deep breath and try to remove as much tissue as we can, including the decimal membrane, and then be able to suture the uh, donor tissue without the um, without the endothelium onto the, uh, onto the cornea and typically in similar suturing fashion uh, as you would do uh, whether interrupted and combined with running suture pending um, page surgeon preference. Um, so I wanna thank uh, my chief, uh, Dr. Christopher Aquano for supplying us with the video. And so with that, that's the end of our lecture. Wow, ended with a bang with that uh, that video. I love that. Thank you, guys.